A uh, long time ago, I wrote a hypervisor called Zen, which happens to run Amazon Web Services and other big clouds around the planet. I'm a huge cyber optimist. Um, so I sit next, next to Richard Stiernan, who brings me down to reality. So, uh, and Bromium is all about virtualization. And I'm going to give you one thing to remember. Virtualization is going to save all of us, OK? And um, that's about cloud. It's about the next generation of the end user endpoint as well. So Bromium is a company that serves um, regulated and uh, and government agent reg regulated agencies, regulated uh, customers in all of the major sectors. I'm going to tell you just a little bit about it, but mostly my focus is on why I'm a cyber optimist, and I want to focus on two things: lessons from Troy and lessons from Byzantium, and they're entirely different, but entirely appropriate. Before I start, just a word from uh, one of our friends on the inside. Virtualization, as I said, is going to save all of us, and certainly we're doing some good things inside, uh, inside the government in the US. OK, so what's the lesson from Troy? You see, a long time ago, there were some Greeks, and they surrounded Troy. And uh, one day, they all went away, and there was this awesome pony on the beach, right? And so people pulled the pony inside. And so the lesson from Troy is actually pretty simple. And it's that nothing's changed since Troy. That is, we humans still do stupid stuff. If you just look at the data from last year, there are about five unique attacks per second, maybe 80,000 incidents, and, and 2,000 plus major enterprise breaches, 90% caused by yeah, the idiot and you and me. The edit in you and me, OK? Maybe more than 70% of those attacked a vulnerability for which a patch had been available for more than a year, OK? And that's not going to change, by the way. We have massive dependencies on legacy software, legacy applications, and so on. And it's very difficult to move forward. And most of the attacks were unique to the target. This data is a year old. The latest data is very interesting. Basically. 97% of malware is now polymorphic and unique to the target device. So good luck, antivirus. Okay, good luck. It's not happening. Good luck, next gen antivirus, because it's just not a real thing. Okay, this whole idea of detect to protect failed at Troy, and it will fail for all time. Can we please all agree on that? Okay, detect to protect will always fail. Got it? OK, on we go. So what are we going to do? We build these big perimeters. And we've done this all the time. Can we please give up on the idea that we can clean the network? OK, I'll give you a bunch of reasons why you can't clean the network. The simplest being crypto. We're moving towards end-to-end -end encrypted pipes. You don't get to see inside the pipe, except at two places, one the proxy and two on the endpoint. And deep in the network, forget it. You have no hope. Okay, you have some metadata maybe. You can do a bit, but you can't do a lot. And then there was this idea that, well, we could put honeypots and all sorts of other cool things in there. And what did we find as a result of that? Oh my goodness. We found the problem that Target had. 500 people working in security going through 100 times more false positives than true alerts, OK? We create the haystack, and then we have to sift through it with humans. And all of these cyber programs we create at universities are basically creating the street sweepers of the digital age, OK? Hey, dude, get this great job in cybersecurity. I want you to go and look at logs, OK? And so the problem really hasn't changed. It's how to spot the attacker. And the problem with this category is that everything looks like a needle. And rather than, rather than take a risk that actually they missed the needle, we're going to go and wipe out the device and the user of Starbucks and blow a bunch of money on remediation. Okay? So we're wasting money, a lot of money on this. Okay? When actually clean design would have helped an awful lot. 
So we're seeing a lot of false alerts, a lot of false alerts, and because of crypto and all these other things, we see a lot of false negatives. Uh, the bad guy can get through. More than 75% of attacks use SSL, TLS. So they fly right through that stuff. They fly right through. So the fundamental problem, whether it's attack based on credentials or malware or anything else, is that it's an end-to-end -end problem. Okay. So let's get that. Let's get this idea that detection is untenable. Ultimately, the attacker has far more resources than you do. They can bury their attack per, uh, per attack instance, and there is no way to detect it. The science is there, and by the way, it was done by Turing about 100 years ago. Okay, it's called the halting problem. And my good friends at Gartner, um, thankfully we saved Richard Stanton from Gartner. Uh, he did great work there, by the way, but now he's doing greater work on the outside. Even Gartner has got it. Okay, so what did Gartner say? Gartner says the rise of the targeted attack, and if, by the way, if you are in a regulated org where you have something of value to steal, the attack is targeted at you. Uniquely at you, because the bad guy knows what you bought, knows your people, knows your systems, and will get through all of them. Because they know how. They have one of everything. And they can crypt their stuff to get through. So the target attack is basically broken the back of the traditional notion of detect to protect. That is Troy. So what can we do that's better? Well, uh, not all threats can be prevented. Seek to detect in response to incidents. Identify compromised systems even when no malware has been detected. Wait up. Anybody spot a problem here? What am I looking for? So here is the latest stat. This is a stat from last just from the last year on average industry incident responses. So average 69 days from occurrence to discovery, seven days to containment, and then 43 for forensics and so on and so on. So the big problem is <coughs> if you don't know what you're looking for, how are you going to go and find it? Okay. So unquestionably the bad guy will get in. How do you go and find the bad guy? And ultimately, I'm, not con I'm convinced that this is not a technology problem. You're going to hear from some great solutions here. But really, this is a human problem. And we have to role model what we have always done as humans, and then we have a shot at it. Let's talk a little bit about that. So the breach is always going to be there. It's going to be the result, <coughs> really, of our humanity our dependence on legacy, our dependence on unpatched systems, unpatchable systems, our tendency to try and be productive, to click on something, and this legacy notion of detection. But there are some lessons from the past, from Byzantium, which help us to define a better way forward. OK, so let's go look at Byz Byzantium. Now, if that were Troy, it ain't. But if that were Troy, the key message here is that you're on the outside. You are thinking like the attacker. Okay? And an amazing discussion that I had with one of the heads of cyber in the US, uh, in the US Army went along the following lines. You wouldn't believe the amount of trust we place in a 19-year-old with a monster cannon nowadays. Okay? So think about it that way. When you build an army and you are attacking something, you have a natural understanding that you will lose some. You build a resilient organization. You understand that you are always going to be vulnerable, yet the most important thing is to win and to complete the mission. Your mission is to be a successful business or a successful organization. And what matters more is winning more, winning most, okay? There is no way to defeat the enemy at the perimeter. The enemy will get in in some way. So how do you build an organization that is structurally more resilient? That is the fundamental thing we have to do in architecting organizations for greater resilience in the cyber domain. And the principle I want you to think of here is what we do in this room right now. Least privilege. You see, I haven't yet told you my bank account number or my PIN number, and I'm unlikely to. And you won't do the same to me, okay? You don't know if I'm a good guy or a bad guy, and you probably won't even when we leave today. There is no need to. 
bring information into a context that is not required for the context to succeed. That's called least privilege. And so architecting your organization for resilience involves things which we have always known as humans. It's essentially rigorous enforcement of least privilege. So for example, micro-segmentation of your network. If the network at target had been decently segmented, the bad guy would have been stuck in the cooling system. Never have got near the point of sales in most. Big deal. Yeah, big deal for target. Okay, just bad network design. N not, not an incredibly sophisticated attacker, just really incredibly stupid network design. Okay? So building systems for resilience, you're hearing messages from many vendors. And I'm going to say it in the context of the endpoint and, and so on. But if you listen to VMware, you're hearing about software-defined networks and micro-segmentation of the network for the workload. If you're listening to your cloud providers, they're saying the same thing. Micro-segment things based on privilege. Then when you get owned in some context, it's not such a big deal. What do you lose? What's exposed in the context? Okay, and, and so that's a fundamental important design construct for any IT environment. So enforcing least privilege through isolation. Isolation structures in physical networks, VLANs, whatever, rooted network segments, whatever it happens to be, virtual machines in the cloud, access levels, privilege management, and so on. These are fundamental building constructs for stronger organizations, and you need to do them. They are fundamental, okay? That is, you can, this whole notion of trying to detect bad, except that it's gone. But if you build a more resilient organization, you can be much more structurally, uh, structurally capable of dealing with it. If you build a hierarchical organization, you monitor everything. You need to know where the bad guys are. So let's just assume that you and I are generals and we're on the battlefield and we're attacking this place. We could have messengers sending messages back and forth between us, but the messengers could work for the other side. They could be killed. What do we not do? We don't put our plans in the back pocket of every soldier and say, hey, let's all meet up in the middle of the battlefield at 2 o'clock this afternoon and run for that door. We don't do that. Okay? We design systems based on least privilege, assuming that we will have losses. Okay? And so we maximize, we, well, we minimize our, our, um, our vulnerability surface, we m minimize the attack surface by maximizing the segregation of information and privilege. Okay. When you have, you are going to get breached. So the key thing here is to minimize the time between a breach and when you know about it, and then automatically recovering from it. And this is an area where computer systems can really help. Computer systems are really, really, really good at healing themselves, at building new systems, at reinstantiating instances that run in the cloud and so on. So if I could do one thing for every organization here, it would be simple. Get you to move to cloud fast. As the quicker I get you to an automated infrastructure, the better. The quicker I get you out of people running around your IT infrastructure with USB keys in their pockets, tripping over Ethernet cables, it's just a better place to be. And the same thing is true on your endpoints. And I'm about to show you how. So on the endpoint world, which is the way in for the attacker, what is the attack vector? It's all the untrusted stuff. It's phishing attacks. It's crypto locked. Oh, thinking of which, thinking of which. Let's just take a break for a sec. And um, you know, we're, I'm a, my company is a McAfee partner. This is a McAfee SDK I got. Uh, very recent. I'm just going to quickly install it. I hope you don't mind because it's important for, for a demo. Thank you. So I just want to quickly install this, uh, this SIA document. Well, this is the new SIA plugins. So you see I'm doing something entirely reasonable, right? I mean, this is the, this is the authentic McAfee doc. I got it. Uh, it was an email attachment sent to me and it's Word and we're all good, right? Okay, we'll just let that guy go. So the untrusted problem here, oh, oh dear, okay. So this is CryptoLocker, hmm, strange. So can we build systems which are naturally resilient to even things like CryptoLocker? By the way, this is real CryptoLocker, right? I mean, I can, you wanna see it in Russian if your Russian's any good? Yep, we can do it in Russian, okay. So the question is, 
can we take this principle of least privilege and enforce it in systems which are really bad at enforcing it? And the answer is yes. You're hearing a story from VMware, okay, and any one of your cloud virtualization vendors, Microsoft for Azure, AWS, and everybody else. What is it? One app per VM, micro-segment the network, least privilege access to the network. By the way, we own the storage, and we can see the execution of the thing. Good place to be. That's where you spot the bad stuff. I'm going to show you how you do exactly the same on this endpoint here. The other thing I would do if I could move you forward, apart from moving you into the cloud, is I would get every single one of you to move forward in terms of your client OS, OK? Because the world gets better there really fast. And I'm going to explain to you why. And again, virtualization is going to be our savior. So let's just leave that crypto locker running because it's kind of fun. OK, it's, so the threat comes from the outside. It comes from our natural tendency to want to be productive and to trust. We as humans have a natural tendency to trust because we are trying to do the right thing. OK, and so it's all the stuff out there. By the way, the biggest deliverer of malware on the planet is our buddies at Google. Not because Google is evil, but because they deliver malvertising. Their ad networks are populated with malicious advertisements. And they have no way to tell which is good and which is bad. Remember, detect to protect fails. So they're really complicit in it. And, and it's a huge, huge problem. So. We can't solve the breach by training people. We can't train stupid out of me. You can't, train, you can't solve the breach by suddenly magically pretending that you're not dependent on Java 7 or on Flash 18. And you can't really solve the problem through detection. What can you do? It turns out that virtualization is going to save all of us. And this, by the way, is happening both on the client as well as in the cloud. And I'm really excited about it. So the idea with micro virtualization is to use the CPU features for virtualization that were built to uh, support virtualization in the cloud. But they're available on every CPU, including on your iPhones and your Samsung devices and everything else. And the idea is to apply those hardware features to hardware isolate tasks in the operating system on the fly, really quickly, in a way that the user won't notice. And in so doing, rely on CPU enforcement of this notion of least privilege to get re resilient, uh, resilience in the endpoint. And so every single time I plug in a USB key or any big tab in my browser, every document I open, every email, whatever, it's all going in a little micro VM. And by the way, you have no idea as a user. So what is a micro VM? If you know virtualization, a micro VM, you want to think of it as being mm, maybe an instant in-memory clone of an operating system or of Windows, say, because we're I'm on a Windows system, but all the supplies to Mac or Android or whatever. So, the evolution of a hypervisor is a thing called a microvisor. It's not unique to Bromium. Bromium's microvisor is simply an evolution of Zen. And the cool thing about this is we've been working with Microsoft. It's coming in Windows. It's in Windows 10. And it's in Windows Server 2016 TP4. And it's going to Azure next year. It's a big deal. It's going to really help. You get all the powers of Intel VTX and all the CPU enforced virtualization. You get to use all the CPU features for security. And each one of these things runs in hardware isolated memory. In essentially a copy on write, instantly created clone of a running system with a few magic changes. So this logical virtual machine basically has no device access, can't turn on the camera or go for the USB device, has a virtual file system which contains just what is needed by the task, has a virtual network which prevents any malware from going to networks that I value, micro-segmentation, can't pivot onto my enterprise network, can't go to any of my high-value SaaS sites, can't go to my bank because I don't want you to, and then it executes copy on write. So any changes that are made in that context are unique to that context itself. And then if this happens to be a tab in my browser, which is pointed at Facebook, it only gets the cookie for Facebook. It doesn't need anything else. OK, so that's hardware enforced least privilege on the endpoint. And we can do this with great density. On this little PC here, I can get a couple hundred micro VMs, and each one of them costs me 15 milliseconds to create. OK, so they're really cheap. And so every single tab in my browser is a different micro VM. So say I go to Facebook, I'm plugged into your physical LAN, in your data center, and I go to Facebook. It's as though that task is running in a DMZ. 
It can't see your enterprise network. It can't see your high-value SaaS sites. It only has the cookie for Facebook. If a bad guy breaks in and steals that, okay, I lost the cookie for Facebook. That's least privilege. Okay? Can't turn on the webcam or anything else. So if you know the concept of essentially a honey, honeypot, this is a honeypot, but it's right here in front of my face. It is the task that I'm using. And so the bad guy could completely own the system all the way down to the hardware. But it's a don't care because you know, breaking a CPU is really, really, really hard. Okay? And breaking into the hypervisor is extraordinarily difficult. Let's just say it's 10,000 times more difficult than any system that is out there today to break because it's a tiny little code interface, about 10,000 lines of code. It's code that we openly hand out to the world's best to break every year for audits. Okay. It turns out that you can also change detection. You see, you can't detect to protect, but you can detect when you are owned. You can, because there's a ton of things to look for. More than that, there's only one task given each one of these things, and you can simply wait for it to do bad stuff, at which point it's very clearly bad. Very clearly bad. And you can simply wait until it does very bad things, at which point it's blinding obvious. Now you've recorded everything it ever did. Got every packet, got every change of memory, got every touch on the file system, or in the Windows case, on the registry. We have full forensics in real time, okay? Which allows us to respond in real time and provide real information in terms of targeted attacks on your organization, which you can then use in real time to search. So, the hypervisor also, as a privileged execution point, has an ability to monitor the system. The moment the user closes the task, throw the whole thing away and malware disappears. So this laptop is unpatched Windows 7. I run legacy everything. And I sit in Starbucks on an unprotected network and I click on malware for my living. The point I want to make to you is that it is possible, technically, to build systems that are resilient by design. Okay? Endpoints, clouds, you can do it. If you build a system which is fundamentally more resilient, you have a shot at escaping um, the attacker. More importantly, each one of these endpoints becomes a sensor. Okay? And we're monitoring it continually. If it ever reports anything bad, then we can immediately go and search every single endpoint in real time to see whether we spot that thing anywhere else. Okay? So the basic idea here is that all of the endpoints can collaborate to help secure the enterprise and to reduce that breach time, that time from uh, incidents to remediation from you know, weeks and so on to days. Now, like every other vendor, we have full access to known bad, but the key thing is to understand the attack that is targeted upon you so that you can find it the moment that your organization is breached. Okay, so we can reduce the time that organizations are suffering from breaches, basically, to zero. Okay. Now, I want, to, I want to step away from just what Bromium does and make a more general industry statement. And why I'm a cyber optimist. This is coming to you. Okay? It's coming to you. You could buy Bromium's product if you want. But the first step of this is just in Windows 10. Go put it out there because you're making yourself much more resilient. And I'll show you how that works. Um, okay. I don't know what I've done here. Sorry. All right. So, just quote from one of our customers. Okay, cool. So, I'm going to quickly explain to you why Windows 10 is getting better, why Windows Server will be better, and why Azure will be better as a result. And by the way, the other cloud folks are doing this too. So, one of the big things in Windows 10 is device centric security. There's a bunch of stuff about device integrity, cryptographic posting, and remote attestation of secure boot. Um, we work with Microsoft in the area of virtualization, have for a long time helped Microsoft to build. Hyper-V, which is their hypervisor. In the area of Windows 10 and Device Guard, um, there are two micro VMs which show up that you've never seen. You will never see them. And there's a very famous attack called Pass the Hash, which is basically if you own the OS, you can steal the credential store and then replay the hashes to get access to other systems. Basically, LSAS, the service which does that, has moved out of the operating system into a micro VM. So you could own the OS, you still can't steal the credentials. Okay, and the code integrity service, which is whitelisting for both kernel mode code and user mode code, 
has now moved out of the operating system into a micro VM alongside the OS, making the system much more resilient. So Microsoft has bitten off on this idea that this additional ring of hardware privilege, which is virtualization, can really change the game in security. And if I could do one thing in terms of the client uh, to improve your posture, it would be just like get you guys to move on as quickly as you can to, uh, to Windows 10 and to more modern infrastructures. Okay, and everything we do just complements what they do. Think of what Microsoft does as being essentially grabbing grabbing the crown jewels of the kingdom, running deeper in the castle, putting up another hardware wall, which is hardware virtualization, and protecting it better. And we're on the ramparts, essentially isolating all the, threat, all the threat vectors. And what we do is entirely compatible with what Microsoft does. And uh, that's a very interesting engineering process, essentially working with Microsoft to get key concepts of micro virtualization into their code. As I said, it's coming in Windows Server 2016. It's in TP4 today. You can go download that and it'll be in Azure next year. Why is this important in Azure? It's important in Azure uh, for containerization. So Microsoft calls that Hyper-V containers. These are ephemeral, lightweight, virtualized structures with hardware multi-tenancy between them, which can be used to run Windows Docker containers or even Linux, Linux Docker containers um, with hardware enforced least privilege between them. Uh, and the whole point here is you get two orders of magnitude greater memory density of VMs per unit memory. By the way, cloud providers just rent memory to you. Um, and you get um, very rapid creation, about 15 milliseconds. Okay, so the world is getting a lot better there. So key things to take away here, security by design is fundamental. Go and look at your architecture and you can get a long way just by doing simple things. But by adopting virtualization, based structures, you can end up with a system which changes your security ops quite dramatically too. No false alerts, because it really was an attack. It really whacked me on the nose. No remediation. Okay, we can defeat each attack. Now, I've been at this five years, and nobody's managed to break this yet. Does that mean it's secure? No, it just means that it's way expensive to break it. Too expensive for the bad guy of today. You get real-time forensic details, and you get continuous detection of response within the organization. Oh, by the way, just before I walk out of here, let's go look at that document uh, with CryptoLocker in it. I'm just going to close it here, and we can go and see what that guy did uh, to my PC. Of course, he's, he's encrypted the document himself. It's kind of funny. OK. So uh, this is just running up in the cloud. It's our thread dashboard. and. Uh, Here's my PC. Sorry, this is very small for you, I realize. Um, but let's go look at what this guy did. Oh, ha hasn't, hasn't uploaded yet. Give one sec. I'm on a rather wimpy wireless network. It'll take a sec. No, still not there. Um, basically, we will have, I can maybe do it locally if it's still uploading. Okay, there it is. I used to do it locally. Okay, so this is what this guy did to my PC while I was talking to you. Word document came in, cool. And look, he started messing around with the registry. Okay. Then he waited a while. Why did he wait a while? Oh, to fly past your fire eyes. See? These guys know they're going to be put into honeypots. And they just wait. And the, sec the, this, the default time, by the way, to get through a fire eyes, 72 seconds. And then, my goodness, then he starts doing crazy stuff, doing long sleep calls, and then he goes off and starts to, to encrypt the file, file system. Okay, and we'll, we'll see that all over the system, right? So he's actually, this version is messing with the registry a lot. So I want, all, all I'm gonna give you is, is a good example of how we can get accurate forensics for every task as it shows up on the endpoint. Uh, I don't want to outstay my welcome. Um, happy to take questions either now or later. Um, but other than that, I will uh, introduce our next speaker.